Okay, this is the lecture video for section 4.1, uh, quadratic functions in my open math. In this section, we talk about quadratic functions, which are functions of the form ax squared plus bx plus c. The a value, the coefficient of the squared term, cannot be zero, otherwise it would not be a quadratic function, and the graph is a parabola. Notice that in these two pictures, you see one parabola that opens upward while the other one opens downward. This is controlled by the sign on the A value. So if that A value is positive, as it states here, then the quadratic function, the parabola, will be a picture that opens upward. When the A value is negative, as it states here, then the parabola will open downward. Okay, parabolas are symmetric with respect to a line called the axis of symmetry, and that is the line that comes right through the vertex and creates um, equal halves on either side of the axis of symmetry. Likewise for this picture. This is the axis of symmetry as labeled here. The point that it goes through, once again, is called the vertex, whether it opens up or down. Okay, we are going to be looking at how to graph quadratic functions given the quadratic function in different forms. Sometimes it will have a single um, parenthesis, sometimes it will have two parentheses, and sometimes it's presented without any parentheses at all. And so we take a different approach in each of those cases um, to graphing the parabola. Let's look first at what we call standard form. So a parabola in standard form will look like the following. Now we have an example of it right down here. And that will be when there is a single parenthesis. And there will be a square on the parenthesis. That's going to tell you um, one of the coordinates of the vertex. For each of these parabolas, the vertex... is said to be at H and K. So if you are given the parabola in standard form, as noted here, you're going to switch the sign as you pull this out to deliver um, the coordinate. You're going to switch the sign. Any formula that is given that has a minus in it, as you take that coordinate out in order to graph it, you have to switch the sign. However, notice that this coordinate, which is actually the y coordinate at the vertex, notice that there's a plus sign in front of it. So for this one, for the k value, you don't switch the sign. You take it as is. Okay, other things that you're seeing here in these um, pictures. Let me make this a little bit bigger. Is notice that in these pictures, the axis of symmetry is shown as the line that comes right down the middle, and the equation for the axis of symmetry, this is a little bit small, is x is equal to whatever the h value is there. Remember, at the vertex, the x-coordinate is called h, and the y-coordinate is called k. So if you want an equation that represents the axis of symmetry, that equation will be written like this. It's a vertical line, this axis of symmetry. All vertical lines are written as x is equal to, and then the number it goes through on the x-axis, which would be the h-coordinate. So if asked for the axis of symmetry, this is your formula. Likewise here, it does not matter if it opens upward or it opens downward. The axis of symmetry will be given as x is equal to the h value. Okay, again, notice that anything where the a value is positive, it opens upward. So these would both be pictures where the a value would be positive. And these are both pictures where the a value, and that's the coefficient of the squared term, where the A value is negative.
Okay, let's take a look at some of the graphs and the forms that they come in and how we start these problems. Okay, let me size down. Okay, so this is example one. And so again, once again, I refer you to the standard form of a quadratic equation. And you can write in your notes if you'd like as a way to recognize them that there is one parenthesis. The square will be on that parenthesis. The value that is with the expre expression, part of the x expression, that's going to be your h value, or in other words, your x coordinate at the vertex. And this constant here that's outside of the parentheses, that will be your k value. Remember to switch the sign on the h value because of the negative that is presented in the formula. Do not switch the sign on this value as stated on the previous page. That will get you the starting point, or in other words, the vertex. So in this particular problem that's in standard form, this is going to be um, help us get the h value right here. We switch the sign when presenting that h value. This is your h value. And then on the k value, we don't switch the sign. Again, you might want to write that in your notes. Switch sign. No switch on this back number, the constant. Okay, so we know where it starts. Also take notice of the a value. Notice that this a value is negative. So because it's negative, because it's less than zero, and in this uh, particular case, it happens to be neg negative two, that's going to make this open down. Anytime that a value is less than zero, which is just a negative number. Find the x-intercepts by solving the equation f of x is equal to 0. Okay, so let's say that we wanted to find these x-intercepts for this particular problem. Do it just like this. Take the function, set it equal to 0. So we would have negative 2 times x minus 1 squared plus 8 is equal to 0. And if you wanted to find the x-intercepts by solving this, you would have to isolate the squared term. That means you'd have to bring this over here, at which point it would become negative 8. You would then be left with this. Negative 2 times x minus 1 squared is equal to negative 8. You could then divide this negative 2 into both sides to get rid of the negative 2 on the left, and this would just um, divide right into the negative 8. You would then be left with just this on the left side, and you'd be left with a positive 4 on the right side. Continuing with how to solve a second degree equation where you have one term squared and just a number on the other side, that calls for the square root property. So you would take the square root here, square root here. On the numeric side, don't forget to report both the positive and the negative root because any kind of even root, when you're taking a square root, that's considered an even root. Any kind of even root has two values or two roots. So this is plus or minus two. And on this side, the square root that we just took dissolves that square. It gets rid of the square. So this goes away leaving you with x minus 1. You now have, let's finish it up here, you have x minus 1 is equal to positive 2, and you also have x minus 1 is equal to negative 2. Okay, completely solve for x by bringing this negative 1 over here, and you have x is equal to 3. So that's going to be one of your x-intercepts. Solve this other little equation by bringing the negative 1 over here, at which point it becomes positive 1, just like over here. Only for this equation, you get negative 2 plus 1, which is negative 1. Okay, so these are your x-intercepts. Let's put what we have so far on the graph. Let's plot these points. We know that it opens down. We know that it opens from 1 8. In other words, that's where it starts. So this is 1. 
So we one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So one eight is gonna be right there. And then my x-intercepts are negative one and positive three. And then I also want to cut through the y-axis properly, so you also want to find the y-intercept. You find the y-intercept by letting x be equal to zero. Okay, so in the function, when I allow x to be zero, that's just an announcement that I'm going to let x be equal to zero, and then actually let it be zero on the side that has the function rule where all the operations are. So all I'm doing is copying the right side of the equation, negative two times x minus one squared plus eight, but I'm putting a zero in for x because this is how a y-intercept is defined. It is the point on the y-axis at which x is equal to zero. Okay, so this would be negative two. Zero take away one is negative one. We're gonna square that, then we're gonna add eight. So order of operations, you do this first. Negative one squared is one. Anything squared is positive. So you get a one for a positive one for that portion right there, times negative two plus eight. Of course, you can put that whole thing in your calculator if you'd like, but it is six. So we are going to hit the y-axis, in other words, the y-intercept is at 0, 6. So that'll be right here. This is 6, this is 8. Okay, reviewing everything that we found on this page. This is the vertex. It opened at 1, 8. We got that right from the standard form equation. It is going to come down through 0, 6, come down right here through um, the point x equal to um, negative 1, and then it's also going to come down on this side and come through this x-intercept. So basically connecting the dots now. There is one side of the parabola. There is the other side of the parabola, and that completes example 1. Now you can use this graph to state the domain and the range. When we talk about the domain in this problem, it's how wide the graph is. These legs actually flare continuously to the right, in other words, to positive infinity, and continuously to the left. So the domain for any kind of parabola is negative infinity to positive infinity. It's how wide it is. Range, on the other hand, means how high and how low does the graph go. This graph goes as high as 8 and as low as negative infinity. Now, when you're talking about the range and you're giving it interval style, you know, any kind of interval notation, you have to talk about the smaller value first and then end by talking about the larger value. Again, this goes as high as 8 and it actually has a point on 8, and then it go, these legs, go, the y values go down to negative infinity. So the range is negative infinity all the way to 8. Okay, let's go to example 2. In example 2, I chose this one just because I think um, some students may get confused when they don't see the squared term first. So you may want to rewrite it. You don't have to, but you may want to rewrite it like this with the squared term first, including the sign that's in front of the squared term because that sign tells you whether it opens up or down. And then you can put the constant. That way it's in the typical form that it's usually given in and may help you from getting confused. So, because this a value is negative, negative, in other words, less than zero, that means that the parabola opens down. Okay, so it opens down, and that's because this a value is less than zero. What is the vertex? Don't forget, switch this sign. Do not switch the sign of the constant. So we're going to open up from 2, 9. 
Okay, regarding finding the x-intercepts. Again, here is the way that you find the x-intercepts. You allow the function to be equal to zero. Set it equal to zero. So we're talking about this rule right here, whether you leave it like this or rewrite it like that, you need to set that equal to zero. That's called the function rule. Okay, so I'm going to just um, use it the way we just rewrote it. You'll get the same answer either way, whether you use it in its original form or the rewritten form. Okay, I'm going to move this 9 first. comes over here. It becomes negative 9. That leaves you with x minus 2 squared with a negative in front of it. I'm going to divide this negative right off the front, the coefficient, and I'm therefore going to have to do the same thing on the other side. That gives me x minus 2 squared is equal to positive 9. Then wanting to solve for x, I want the square to go away. So I'm going to take the square root on this side, thus making the square go away, and that will force me to take the square root on the other side as well. Whenever you are taking a square root, you need to report both the positive and the negative root on the numeric side. So here the square just goes away and out pops the radicand. That's what that's called. And then over here, you get plus or minus whatever the square root of 9 is, which is 3. You then are able to create two smaller equations. And those, the solutions for those two smaller equations will give you the x-intercepts. So we have x minus 2 is equal to positive 3. And x minus 2 is equal to negative 3. Solving for x. You get x is equal to 5. Solving this one for x, you get x is equal to negative 1. And those are your x-intercepts. Okay, so we know that it opens down. We know that it opens from 2, 9. We also know that the x-intercepts are 5 and negative 1. We can put all those things on the graph. So if we go to 2, this would be 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. I'll make this 9. Okay, so I'm going to start from right there. I'm going to come down through the x-axis at negative 1 as well as 5. Okay, I also want to know where to cut through the y-axis, so I'm going to find the y-intercept. So mimicking all the same steps that I did in example 1. The only difference in this problem is that it was rewritten in a way that possibly you wanted to rewrite the squared term first, if that helps clear up things for you, and then the constant at the end, like uh, you were given in example 1. Okay, y-intercept, don't forget, just let x be 0. Plug in 0 for x. So again, using the function rule, doesn't matter whether you use it the way it was originally given or this way. <clears throat> so this is 9 minus 0 for x. This is squared. And we want to figure out what happens. What do you get when you plug in the 0? If you want to start by announcing that you plugged in 0, you can say I'm evaluating the function at 0, or you can just go about your business and plug it in on this side. You don't have to put that if you don't need, want to. So then this would be 9 minus negative 2 squared, which is 9 minus 4. Don't forget, anything squared comes out positive. This is just the minus sign that was out there. So... You know, f evaluated in anything is the same thing as y. We can call f of x or f of any number the y value. So you can put the y in place of that if you'd like. This is the y-intercept. When x is 0, you can also write it as a point, as I did in the, in the first example. This would be 0, 5. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay, so you have a nice, beautiful graph. Coming right through the y-intercept, starting at the vertex, coming through the y-intercept, and also the x-intercept. And then come through the other x-intercept, and you have the other side of the graph.
Okay, just basically connecting all the points that you just plotted. The vertex to nine. This was the y-intercept. If you want to label these, not that you have to, but I, if I ask you a question, you should know which one's which. This is a y-intercept at 0, 5, and these two are called x-intercepts. This is an x-intercept, and this is an x-intercept. Why don't we also add to this graph the, ac the axis of symmetry, a term that I went over on the first page. It is a line, not a point. It is a line that goes right through the vertex, a vertical line. There is a name for this line. This line is called, any vertical line is called x is equal to because every single point on this line has the same x value. That x value is the h coordinate. Because Remember this is called h and k. It's just a special name we give to the x and the y coordinate. We just call it h and k when you're at the vertex. So whatever your h value is, that is the val that's the x value that every single point on this vertical line has. If you were to name this point right up here, this would be called 2, 7. This is 2, 6. This is 2, 5. This is 2, 4. So this entire line is filled with points where the x value is 2, and therefore the name of this line, or what we call the axis of symmetry, I'm just going to abbreviate is x equal to 2. You should know how to give that as well. Okay, domain and range for all parabolas. These legs, I know they look like they go straight down, but they really, they flare very slightly. If you were to continue plotting points, you would eventually see that flare. So this gets as wide as negative infinity to positive infinity. And that will be your domain for all parabolas, even if they're shifted. The range is how high and how low it goes. This goes as high as 9 and as low as negative infinity. We're talking about the y values when we talk about range. Here we're talking about the x values, or in other words, how wide it is. This is how high and how low it goes when you're talking about the y value. So it goes down to negative infinity and as high as positive 9. Now since there's actually a point on positive 9, I'm putting a bracket around it, but all infinity symbols are encased by parentheses. Okay, why don't we go back to example 1 and also throw in that axis of symmetry even though it wasn't a question, but we might as well practice it. Okay, so here's your axis of symmetry. It emanates from the vertex, begins at the vertex, and goes straight down. It is a vertical line, and therefore it is called x is equal to, and the formula you were given on page 1 is that the axis of symmetry is x is equal to whatever the h value is because every point on this line actually goes through that h value, which was 1. So the actual equation for the axis of symmetry is x equal to 1. Okay, let's go to example 3. In example 3, we have um, f of x is another standard form equation, only this one. This time it opens up. Okay, and that's because the coefficient, which is right here, this a value, you can see that it's a 1. It's a positive number. And any time your uh, a value is anything greater than 0, then it opens up. And I guess I could have just circled it. The vertex, don't forget the number that is with the x inside the parentheses when it's in standard form like this, where you see only one parenthesis, you must switch the sign on that number, but don't switch the sign on the value that's not in the parentheses. That's the k value. This one gives you the h value, but you must switch the sign. This one gives you the k value. Do not switch the sign.
Okay, we're going to start our vertex at 3, 1, and we're going to open upward. X-intercepts, I've demonstrated that in the previous two examples. I'll uh, demonstrate it again. Okay, so let's see. We're going to go the function rule, x minus 3 squared plus 1. is equal to 0. We're going to try and solve that. And you may notice something right away. I'm going to bring this to the opposite side. I get a negative 1. And at that point, I have x minus 3 squared is equal to a negative number. And you may choose to stop right here because there's no way that anything squared could ever be a negative. That means there is no solution for this equation. And this uh, equation was created in an effort to find the x-intercepts. So if the equation that would have found us the x-intercepts results in no solution, that implies that there are no x intercepts. In other words, this particular parabola does not hit the x-axis at all. And that could be true. If you have a graph that opens upward, as is the case in this particular problem, maybe the vertex is high enough that it never comes in contact with the x-axis and it just keeps going up. Therefore, it never makes contact with the x-axis. So the parabola never touches the x-axis. And you'll see that when you graph the points. Okay, let's graph what we have so far. We start at 3, 1. So this is 3, go up to 1. That's our vertex. Okay, then if we plot, um, if we try to plot other points, we could do points like the y-intercept because we don't have any x-intercepts and we were building much of our parabola based on those x-intercepts. We were coming from the vertex downward and then hitting the two x-intercepts. So that built the width of the parabola. But yet we don't have that this time. So we're going to have to come at it from a different angle. This time that y-intercept is going to be very important and we're going to play right off of that y-intercept and find the mirror image of the y-intercept. So remember y-intercept is found by letting x be equal to 0 and you're doing that right here. So you can announce it if you like like this. You're taking the function and you're plugging in 0, and you're plugging it in right here where the function rule is. So this would be negative 3 squared plus 1. Okay, this ends up being negative 3 squared or 9 plus 1. And you can write this part as y if you'd like. f of x can be written as y, but so can f of any number. That if you can you wipe out that whole name of the function and replace it with y. So as a point, you can write it like this if you'd like. 0 produced a y partner of 10. That is the y-intercept. Okay, so 0, 10 would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Let's say 10. Let's make this 9. We'll make this 10. And so 0, 10 would be about right there. And what you have to do if you want to try and work with mirror images, I'm going to form the mirror image of 0, 10. All you have to do is look at where this point is with respect to the vertex. If you were trying to move from the vertex to this point, you'd have to move 3 units to the left and 9 units up in the air. Mimic those moves on the other side of the vertex. And let me get this out of the way because I was trying to label but it's in the way. So instead of moving 3 to the left, move 3 to the right. 1, 2, 3. And then go match that height by moving 9 units up from the vertex. So we now have perfect width on this parabola. Okay, so instead of using the x-intercepts, 
we used the one y-intercept we had, and then we played off of that y-intercept 0, 10, and we found its mirror image. Because some parabolas don't have x-intercepts for us to build the width of the parabola with. So this was um, 4, 5, 6, and up at a height of 9. And those two points have helped us get the proper width. Again, you can do the axis of symmetry, come right through that vertex, and form a vertical line. So this axis of symmetry would be called x is equal to, and whatever the h coordinate is at the vertex. I'll label it over here. That vertex was 3, 1. This is the h coordinate, the x coordinate at the vertex. And the axis of symmetry is called x is equal to whatever the h value is. So that would be your equation for the axis of symmetry. Okay, use the graph to state the domain and range as stated in all three exam in the other two examples and now in this one as well. All parabolas have a domain of negative infinity to positive infinity. The range, on the other hand, you're going to have to analyze the graph to see how low and how high it goes. This goes down to a depth of positive 1. So that lowest y value, because you're talking the y values, you want to pay attention to the y values when you're talking about range. It goes down to 1 and as high as positive infinity on those y values. Okay, 1 would be the very smallest y value and positive infinity as those y values get bigger and bigger and bigger. Infinity would be mentioned at the end of the interval this time. Okay, moving to example 4. Now we move to um, a parabola that's given in a different form. And this time, instead of it being in standard form, um, we have it as ax squared plus bx plus c, and this is, um, there's no parentheses here at all, so you can't just pull the numbers out of the, um, out of the parentheses as we did last time. So that is a little, kind of an easier way to get started when it's in that standard form, but when it is not in standard form, then you have to begin the problem in a different way, and that's what you're seeing right here. This is saying that each one of the values, each one of the coefficients in this parabolic equation or quadratic equation is called a, that's the coefficient of the square term, b is the coefficient of the first degree term, and c is the constant. And if you're looking for the vertex in an alternative way because you were not given the equation in standard form, this is the formula you're going to use. This is going to help you find h. I'll write it over here, even though it's part of this paragraph. h is found by just taking the b value, switching the sign, and then dividing by 2 times the a value. And then um, for the k value, okay, and again, this is to find the vertex. It's going to take you a little bit more work this time because it's not in standard form. You just substitute this value into, and they show it like this. They're saying, take the function and plug in the value that you just got for h. I'm just going to write substitute. Substitute this value. Okay, I'm going to demonstrate it. Okay, first of all, does the parabola open up or down? Again, look at this a value. This a value is a negative. It is an a value that is less than zero. Anytime it's negative, it opens down. Okay, so we're going to open down. The vertex, we're on our way to finding it. First, we want to find the h coordinate. You find the h coordinate by doing negative b over 2 times a. So the b value, let's make sure you know what the, the a, b, and the c I already labeled the a. It's negative 1, so need, no need to label that again. The b value is negative 2, and this is your c value. Just mentioning all three of them, even though we only need a and b. So h value is negative b over 2a. Okay, pop that b value in there. A value is negative 1, 
So this is going to be positive 2. Opposite of negative 2 is positive 2. 2 times negative 1 is negative 2. And the h value is negative 1. Okay, so I'll put my vertex over here. This is part of it. And then k, you do it by substitution. Okay, so once you have this value, h is the same thing as x. So you can take the h value, which is the front part of the vertex, or in other words, the x coordinate, it just happens to be called h at the vertex, and you can plug that negative 1 anywhere you see an x in the, in the uh, quadratic function. That's exactly what I'm going to do. So I'm going to take the value I just got, which is negative 1, and I'm going to plug it into the function wherever there's an x. So this will be positive 1, but with a negative in front of it. This will be negative 2 times negative 1, positive 2, minus 1 again. So this is um, negative 1 plus 2, 1. 1 minus 1, 0. And this would be your y-coordinate. Another, again... Anytime you have f of x, you can write it as y. You can replace it with y. You can also replace f of negative 1, f of 2, f of, f of any number can be written as y. You're finding the y value. So you can also write it as a point. We plugged in negative 1, as we announced right here, and what we got for a y partner is 0. It's just that this particular x and y happens to be called the vertex. So you could think of it as x and y, but it's also called h and k. So more work when it comes to finding the vertex, if it's not in standard form. So if you don't see that single parenthesis as we had in, in examples 1, 2, and 3, then um, you're going to have to start your problem by finding the vertex this way. So this is negative 1, comma 0. Okay. Find the x-intercepts by solving f of x is equal to 0. So we'll find the x-intercepts the same way. So we're going to take the function rule. Negative x squared minus 2x minus 1. And we're going to set it equal to 0. Just take the entire function and set it equal to 0. Okay, I think I'm going to do away with these negatives first. I'm going to get rid of this leading negative because it'll make it easier to factor and get the two x-intercepts. I'm dividing everything by negative 1. All that's going to do is switch each of these signs. So it'll become positive x squared, positive 2x, and positive 1. Okay, I'm going to try and factor this, see if it can factor. Because that would be the way to find the two x values. And if I can't, then I'll use quadratic formula. So the way to break up x squared would be x times x, and then the, the values that go in the back are the factors of this constant, 1 and 1. Okay, x times x, I'm just checking it, because I'm using the method called guess and check. So I guessed it how to break up the x squared, which would be this way, and I guessed it how to break up the constant, 1 times 1. Checking it now by foiling. x times x, x squared. x times 1. 1x. 1 times x again is another 1x. That's 2x, just like we have, and then 1 times 1 is that constant. So it comes out exactly like the polynomial that I had here, so I factored it properly. When you try to create the equations from these two factors, you have identical twin factors, therefore no need to solve it twice. You're going to get the same answer all over again. So just solve this one, and you see that the only x-intercept you have is negative 1 because by the time you bring this over here it becomes a negative 1. So this time there's only one x-intercept. So as you've seen from the examples that I've chosen for you, sometimes your parabola has two x-intercepts. You saw that in examples 1 and 2. Then example 3, we moved to a case where there were no x-intercepts, and, and that was because the vertex was above the x-axis, and it opened up. Therefore, it had no way of making contact with the x-axis, 
so it had no x-intercepts. This time we have one x-intercept, so it's just, it actually opens up right from the x-axis, which you'll see as I plot these points. So go plot the vertex. The vertex is at negative one zero. That's right there. And then the whole thing is going to open. Uh, oh, this one opens down. This one opens down from here. So it only touches the x-axis at that one spot. Um, we can also find the y-intercept because we're going to be opening down from here. So we will be hitting the y-axis at a particular point, And you need to be able to demonstrate that you know how to calculate that. So as I have done in examples 1, 2, and 3, when you want to find the x-intercept, just let x be equal to 0. Okay, you can announce it. If you want, you can say I'm plugging in zero into the function. So I'm putting zero right in here and I'm putting a zero right in there. Okay, this term would be gone, this term would be gone, and all you'd have left is negative one. You can call this the y coordinate or you can write it as a point. When plugging in 0 for x, you get a y partner of negative 1. And this is your y-intercept. So you are going to, your graph is going to intersect with the y-axis at negative 1, right there. So again, we don't have two x-intercepts. We're opening out right on the x-axis at our vertex. So again, let's play right off of the y-intercept that we have. We have this point at 0, negative 1, and if we want to get the true width of this parabola, we can find the mirror image just like we did in the last problem. Notice that from this vertex, this point with respect to the vertex, if you were standing on your vertex right here, which was at negative 1, 0, this was H and this is K. I'm just labeling these so that we can do the axis of symmetry in a minute. But if you were trying to say, what kind of moves would I have to make if I moved from the vertex to this y-intercept? You'd have to move one to the right, one down. Just mimic those moves on the other side of the vertex. Instead of going one to the right, go one to the left, and then drop down to that same depth as the y-intercept that you already have graphed. And there you have a nice, perfect parabola by getting the mirror image of the y-intercept. So this was the y-intercept. This was the mirror image that we got from the y-intercept. This one is at negative 2, negative 1. And with those three points, nice graph. If you want to put the axis of symmetry in that picture, you just come right from the vertex and straight down. That axis of symmetry will be called x is equal to the h value. Okay, so there is the axis of symmetry. Okay, now coming to example five. Okay, minimum and maximum. Consider the quadratic function of the form ax squared plus bx plus c. When your a value is positive, it's going to open like this, upward. And so the vertex is what we call a minimum and it is found like this. They're, they're actually telling you by stating this that they want the y value. Because remember, when you find the x value at the vertex, you're just going negative b over 2a. But when you take that value and plug it into the function, you're finding the y value. So they want to know what the y value is at the vertex. That's what we refer to as the minimum uh, the minimum value. 
Okay, if, it, if that a value is negative, then that means you're talking about a parabola that opens downward. And this time, instead of it being called a minimum y value, then in this case it's called a maximum y value. It's the actual highest y value on the graph. Okay, so when it opens upward, that y value at the vertex is called the minimum y value. And when it opens downward, because the a value is negative, which makes it open downward, this would be the maximum y value at the vertex. Okay, so let's see if we can answer the type of questions that refer to this. So in example 5, it says f of x is equal to negative 3 x squared plus 6x minus 13. Determine without graphing whether the function has a minimum value or a maximum value. Well, for that, all you have to do is determine, whether, look at the a value. Notice that the a value here is negative 3, and any time you have a negative coefficient in front of the squared term, that means that it opens downward. And when it opens downward, that value at the vertex is called the maximum y value. So in this particular case, it's a maximum value. Find the minimum or maximum value and determine where it occurs. So when they say this part right here, find the maximum, we already know it's a maximum, not this, Find the maximum value. For this, they're talking about you finding the y value. When they say, where does it occur? That means they want its x partner. So you're basically finding both. Okay, so we need to find the x value before we can find the y value. You have to do this first. And when you find this, you're really just finding the front portion of the vertex, that what they call, what they refer to as h. The same thing as x. So the x value right at the vertex, you can also refer to this as h, is negative b over 2a. Okay? Just like they're giving you right here. The x value is negative b over 2a. Okay, so in this particular problem, the opposite of your b value, then we're going to take 2 and multiply it by the a value. Just go look at your function, and in this function, the a value was negative 3. Put that, whoops, b value. I need the b value there. So the b value was um, 6, but I'm going to be switching the sign, so it's going to be negative 6, and the a value is negative 3. So this ends up being negative 6 at the top, negative 6 at the bottom, or in other words, 1. That's the x value. Then if you want the y value, that just comes from substituting. You take this and substitute it into the function. So the function with the 1 plugged in that we just got and copying the rest of that function and doing the same thing on the right side as I announced I was going to do on the left side. So it's going to be negative 3 times 1 squared plus 6 times 1 uh, minus 13. Okay, and you can pop all that in your calculator if you'd like. This is 1 times negative 3 is negative 3 plus 6. This plus this is 3. And then you take away 13 and you get negative 10. Okay, negative 3 plus 6 is 3. 3 take away 13 is negative 10. Okay, so what is the maximum y value? Let me write that here. The maximum y value is y equal to, because remember, you could take this whole f of anything, and it, that's the y value. You can replace it with a y. The maximum y value was negative 10. Where does it occur? At x equal to, running out of room here, at x equal to 1. Okay, so let's see, what's next? 
give the equation for the parabola's axis of symmetry. These two values that you just found, the x and the y, oops, my pencil's not working. Let's try this one. Okay, so this would be 1, and then uh, the y partner was negative 10. So yes, we called it x and y, but x and y, when you're talking the vertex, when you have found the x and the y using this formula, negative b over 2a, you're really finding the h coordinate. In fact, when we were finding the vertex in that manner, that was the formula that was given to us. h is the same thing as x, y is the same thing as k. So, what is the equation of the axis of symmetry? The axis of symmetry is always written for these kind of parabolas, vertical parabolas that open either up or down, as x is equal to whatever the h value is. That would be the equation for the axis of symmetry. Identify the function's domain and range. Well, you can tell that just, you can tell the range just from the vertex. Even without giving a, without giving a full graph, you can tell what the domain and the range is. You had, we had determined that um, this was a function that opens downward. Okay, so just like a really basic simple graph, it opens down and that very maximum value, the vertex, is at 1, negative 10. So it would be it would be a parabola that you would move one unit over if you were going to draw an xy grid and it would be down at negative 10. So that determines you know your very highest y value. That's the highest it gets. This is the maximum y value at negative 10. And then all the y values are smaller and smaller and smaller going all the way down to negative infinity. That's when you're giving the range. You have to think about those y values. So they go as low as negative infinity and all the way up to no higher than negative 10. At that point being a point that's right on negative 10. The domain, well, the domain for all parabolas is negative infinity to infinity. Okay, I'm going to stop this video here and I'm going to present six through the end of the examples in the next video for this particular section.